Let's meet together in Jonah chapter 4. We've seen the prophet Jonah go through quite a bit in the last three weeks. And while we might expect him today to be ecstatic, to be joyful that God has moved in Nineveh, what we find is a furious prophet. Renee and I had just gotten married, and we decided after our wedding that we would not go on our honeymoon until January. I had to go to class at Southern like a week after we got married, so we had no time to go on a honeymoon. So we decided to go to Panama City Beach in January, but we moved just three days after our wedding. We got married here in Oklahoma, and then three days into it, decided what we needed was a 10-hour car ride to Louisville, Kentucky. And after that, and we did pretty good, we thought we had solved this marriage thing. If you can make it 10 hours in a car, you're good to go. And we were still in that honeymoon phase. We can't do anything wrong. She's perfect. He's okay. And so we kind of just thought, we've got this thing figured out. It's not really that hard. Well, that was until the first night in our new apartment. We had been unpacking all day, and because we moved three days after we got married, we still had a lot of presents we hadn't unboxed yet. And so because we were unpacking, in a small apartment, you've got a limited amount of room. And so Renee had unwrapped this bed sheet set that someone had gifted us. Now, we already had sheets on our beds, so we didn't really need them at that moment. And she's yelling at me from the other room, where do you want me to put these? Well, I'm in the living room trying to get something assembled. She's in the bedroom. I said, well, just put it in our closet. Because we were fortunate we had a walk-in closet with shelves in there. I said, just put them on the shelf. And she said, well, I can't reach. There's too much stuff on there. I said, just throw it up there. <laughs> well, about five seconds after saying that, I said, you know, maybe I should just be a good new husband and go in there and put it up there for her. And as I walk into the bedroom and I walk into the closet, I see her take those bed sheets and just chunk them up on top of the shelf. And we discovered that day that our shelves were not properly installed. Because the minute those bed sheets hit those shelves, everything came tumbling down. Now, here's how I should have responded. I should have said, that's my fault. I should not have said to throw them up there. I'll take care of it. What I did was, why would you do that? Why would you throw them up there like that? Did you not think the shelves might come tumbling down? Instead of responding with admitting fault, I responded with anger, like dumbfounded that she would do exactly what I told her to do. I was unjustly angry. I had no reason to be mad at her. And we've all been there before. We're angry, we're mad, but we really have no reason to be. But what we often do is when that's pointed out to us that we have no reason to be mad, we often double down. Or we try to justify it because we don't want to admit that we have done something wrong. We somehow want to convince people, no, I, I know I have no reason to be mad, but really I have a reason to be mad. And we just cause more damage in the process. We just cause more issues. And when we do that, we become just like our friend Jonah. Jonah has seen one of the greatest revivals in recorded scripture take place in Nineveh. He has seen God deliver a people that they repented, they believed, and God showed them mercy. But instead of being joyful, Jonah is angry. Jonah is furious for no good reason. But we see that his fury is actually very targeted. We see beginning of the story that Jonah's fury is over the people. Look at me at verses 1 through 4. I'm sorry, 1 through 3. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Not the response we expected from a prophet of God, is it? The prophet should be praising God, but he's furious. And in fact, verse 1 is more wicked than we often give it credit for. You see, if we translate verse 1 literally, it says, And this was exceedingly evil 
to Jonah. Now that should strike a chord with us because we've seen the word evil a few times already in the book of Jonah. In chapter 1, the Lord told Jonah, Go to Nineveh, for their evil has arisen before me. And then Jonah is on a ship. The the storm comes from the Lord, and the sailors say, Which God has caused this great evil to come upon us? And then Jonah goes to Nineveh. He preaches a five-word message. Forty days, Nineveh will overturn. And then Nineveh, it says, turn from their evil ways. And now to the prophet of God. What he sees happening in Nineveh is evil. He doesn't like it. He didn't want the Ninevites to repent. He understood the message of God to mean judgment was coming upon them. God meant it to mean he was going to show them forgiveness and mercy. And this, to Jonah, was exceedingly evil. We thought we saw the lowest point of Jonah's descent. But we haven't seen just how low the prophet goes until now. The grace of God to the prophet of God is not something worth celebrating. It is something worth being angry over. He calls it evil. But then he goes a step farther. He says, is this not why I fled? I fled because I knew you would do this, God. And look what he does in verse 2. He says, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Well, the prophet does here. This is the lowest point in Jonah, if you're asking me. Because Jonah is taking one of the most foundational passages in the Old Testament, Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7, and he's throwing it in the face of God. Because in Exodus 34, Moses wanted to see the glory of God. He wanted to see God, and God said, I will cause my glory to pass by you. And when the glory of the Lord passes by him, he says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, the children's children, to the third and the fourth generation. This is one of the foundational passages in the entire Old Testament. And what does Jonah do with it? God, it's your fault that I fled. Your character is the reason why I didn't want to go in the first place. Very similar to what Adam did in the garden. What is this that you have done? The woman you gave to be with me. She gave me the fruit and I ate. The prophet uses the very character of God against God. We thought he had sunk low when he sank to the bottom of the ocean, but this is how low Jonah has gone. He might have repented in chapter 2 from trying to control who's saved, but he hasn't repented of his hatred towards a people known as the Ninevites. And so now he's angry. Now he's furious. And this drama queen says, Lord, just kill me. Just end my life. I don't want to live any longer. I don't want to see Nineveh be shown mercy. I don't want to see them repent. Just kill me. And God would be completely just to answer that prayer request. But notice what God does to the prophet. Verse 4, And the Lord said, Do you do well? To be angry? Do you do well to be angry? He would have been just to respond to Jonah and to wipe Jonah out right then and there. But instead, he asked a question Do you do well to be angry? I remember when I was in middle school, about seventh and eighth grade, uh, I was what you would call a problem child, meaning about every week I had something go on that my parents found out about. But I finally made it one whole week without doing anything major. Now, something minor happened. I didn't get in trouble for it, but they didn't call my parents. So I would rebuke his children. But at times, in order to draw them closer to himself, he asked a question he already knows the answer to. To draw you closer. Is this not what he did with Adam and Eve in Genesis 3? He knew they ate the fruit. He knew what they had done. But instead, he said, where are you? 
to draw them out. In the same way, he goes to his prophet and says, do you do well to be angry? And today, God has a similar question to all of us. Not to force us out, but to draw us near. Do you do well to continue in your lust? Do you do well to continue with the idol you've built up? Do you do well to be bitter? Do you do well to be angry? Do you do well to be unforgiving? Do you do well to whatever you've got to fill that blank with? God's not trying to force you away. He's trying to draw you near. Because that's the grace of God shown even to a furious prophet. And the grace of God shown even to a rebellious and sinful people. Do you do well today? But notice Jonah does not answer God's question. Rather, Jonah shifts the focus of his fury. He was furious at a people who he did not want to see be shown mercy to. But now we're going to see Jonah's fury over the plant. Look at verses 5 through 8. Jonah went out to the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah so that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. And then notice this phrase. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. At this point, I hope you see that Jonah might just be the biggest drama queen in all the Bible. He just might hold the record. But look at what happens. He goes and he sits by himself to where he can see Nineveh. Why? Because he wants to see maybe they'll mess up. Maybe they're not genuine. Maybe they're going to go back to their evil ways. It just maybe God will still show judgment on them. So Jonah's basically waiting back, trying to figure out if they're genuine or not, and just waiting for them to fail. Not unlike some Christians we know. A new believer comes forward, gives their life to Christ, and we often have skepticism. We'll wait to see. We'll wait. They're going to mess up. It's not genuine. They've done this before. It's not real. Just like Jonah. But notice, Jonah never answered God's question. What does he do? He goes away from the Lord. So again, what's Jonah doing? He's fleeing. He's fleeing from God, fleeing the question of God, fleeing the word of God, just like he did in chapter 1. And again, what does the Lord do? He uses unlikely objects to teach his prophet a lesson. And this time he uses a plant, and then he uses a worm. And what the plant and the worm show us is this. When God disciplines his people, he always does so with grace and with judgment. The plant was a grace of God to the prophet who did not deserve it to keep him cool, to provide him shade. Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. He might have thought that it was evil of God to send grace to the Ninevites, but this plant, he might think God's finally doing something right. He's finally taking care of me. But then the Lord appoints a worm. So the plant is a grace, the worm is a judgment. And the worm takes care of the plant. And then a scorching east wind comes. And what is Jonah again? Furious. God, just kill me. Just in this. I want to die. And the Lord again asks that probing question. Do you do well to be angry for the plant? This time Jonah responds, but notice the drama queen continues, and he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. What a joke. What a drama queen. What a response to a probing question from God. Do you do well to be angry? Yes, I do. At this moment, we'd expect God to wipe out the prophet, wouldn't we? 
After all, he's asked twice. Jonah's fled. We thought the fish took care of the situation. He repented of one sin, but not the core sin, not the core problem that he had. And so here he is fleeing from God again. He's under the grace and judgment of God that he shows him to discipline him. And when God asks the question, do you do well? He says, yes, just kill me. But instead of being shown wrath, we see God's patience with the prophet. Look at his response in verses 10 and 11. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, a great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? So Jonah says, kill me, and the Lord says, do you do well to be angry over a plant you did not grow? Do you do well to be angry over a plant you had nothing to do with? And he's trying to show Jonah that he has no reason to be angry. And he says, should I not have pity over the Ninevites I created? You did not create the Ninevites. You did not bring them into existence. I did. Do I not have the right to show pity to the people I created? And what goes even further is God really puts it to Jonah by saying, in which there are 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left. Now, if you study ancient history, Nineveh had more than 120,000 people. So why that number? I believe God's talking about children who can't understand their decisions. So what is God really asking Jonah? Should I wipe out children because you're so angry? Should I not show pity to children who do not know what their parents do? Is that what you want me to do, Jonah? Do you want me to wipe out the children? Do you want me to wipe out them? Do you want me not to show them mercy? Should I not show them pity? Should I not be merciful and gracious? Quite a question to be asked if you're a prophet. I mean, we would expect to see Jonah's answer. I mean, after all, God is essentially saying, why are you so angry when I'm happy? Why are you so angry when what I've done brings me glory? And again, I've told you a couple weeks ago, there are similarities between this story and the most famous parable in the entire New Testament, the parable of the prodigal son. We saw in chapter 2, Jonah was quite like the younger son who fled, who wasted his inheritance on reckless living, but came to his senses and went to his father. But now Jonah's not like the younger son, rather, he's like the older. And if you don't know, the point of the the parable of the prodigal son is not the younger son, it's the older one. Because who is Jesus talking to in that parable? He's not talking to lost people, he's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the Pharisees who grumbled that Jesus would eat with sinners and tax collectors. And the older son hears the news that his brother has returned. There's a party going on. His father is ecstatic. And does the older brother then go to the party? No, he goes away. And what does the father do? Just like he did with the younger son, he goes to where the older son is. And what does the older son say? Look, I've been with you all these years. I've never even asked for a young goat to share with my friends. Yet when this son of yours came, who devoured his inheritance on wasteful living, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. The older son cared nothing about the father's happiness that his younger son had come back. In fact, notice the older brother doesn't say, when my brother came back, he says, this son of yours, angry while the father is happy. And what does the father do? It's right for us to celebrate. For this brother of yours was lost and is now found. He, is de- he was dead, but now he is alive. And the parable just ends. Quite like Jonah just ends with this question from God. There's no resolution to this story. We don't know what Jonah did, and we don't know what the older son did. And doesn't that drive us a little crazy? I mean, if you go watch a movie in theaters and it just ends right before, right at the climax and you don't know how things go, are you happy you went and saw that movie? What about a book that doesn't end with any resolution? Do you want to read that book? It drives us crazy. We want to know the answers. We want to know who was at that party with the younger son. We want to know how did the older brother respond. We wanted to know how did Jonah respond to all of this. But that's because we're Western thinkers. You see, in Jewish literature, in Hebrew literature, 
They care less about you having definitive answers, and they care more about you learning to ask the right question. So what's the question we're to ask? What are we to ask from Jonah, this mirror that we are to compare ourselves to? What is this book as a whole calling us to ask ourselves? It's actually very simple. Am I satisfied with God? Am I satisfied with God? Jonah was angry at a people and a plant, but who was he really angry at? God. For not being the God he wanted him to be. For not doing what he expected him to do. For not acting according to how Jonah wanted him to act. Jonah was not satisfied with who God was. Are you satisfied with who God is? Are you satisfied with God today? You know, we've spent a lot of time talking about, and rightfully so, the Asbury revivals that are, that's been happening for a few weeks now. And if you want to know where I stand on that, I preached a sermon last week. I talked about it. I think I pretty much showed you all where I stand. You can go watch that. don't want to give everything away here. But I'm starting to have a concern with the revival. And it has really nothing to do with the revival itself. I'm getting concerned that we're getting so preoccupied with the revival that's happening outside of these walls, we're missing the revival God wants to do in each one of our hearts. We're celebrating a good move from God, but are we missing the move God wants to do in our own lives? Are we missing the revival He wants to bring to us as individuals and to us as a church? Because how do revivals ultimately begin? with people crying out for more of God. And they're satisfied with more of Him. Can that be said of you? Are you satisfied with God? Do you hunger for more of God today? Because A.B. W. Tozer says, we have as much of God as we actually want. You have as much of God today as you actually want. The question is, do you want? Why do we not hunger for more of God? Why are we not begging for more? Why are we not seeking more? See, a lack of hunger for God demonstrates a dissatisfaction with Him. And we may not want to admit it, but we have those moments where we think we can do God's job better than He can. Where we think God should have moved this way instead of this way. Where we wonder why God would allow certain things to happen. Why would God do this? Why has God acted this way? Why has God not granted my prayer request this way? Why has God caused this to happen to me? You know what that ultimately is? We are not satisfied with who God is or what God does. And we will not hunger for something we are not satisfied by. Are you satisfied with God? Do you want more of God in your life? You might be wondering, how do I get more of God in my life? What do I need to do? It's really simple. God has not made it hard. You spend time with Him. You open up His Word. He's revealed to you all that you need to know about Himself to draw you closer to Him. Just open it and read it. Pray and worship and fast and draw near to the Lord. He has not made it difficult. He is accessible to all His children. Do we spend time with Him? And for some of you, God misses your company. He misses your company. So we make excuses all the time. I don't have the time. I don't have the schedule. I can't do it. I'm too busy. And we need to get brutally honest for a moment and just admit that is not a good excuse. Because we will make time for what we prioritize. We will make time for what we want. If we want to wake up early in the morning and go fishing, what are we going to do? We're going to go fishing. We want to wake up early in the morning and go sit in a deer stand, what are we going to do? We're going to go sit in the deer stand. If Black Friday has great deals and you've got to be at the store at 3 a.m., what are we going to do? We're going to be there at 3 a.m. We make time for what's important to us, but we can't wake up maybe an hour earlier to spend time with the Lord. 
You might say, well, you don't understand, I'm not a morning person. But look, I know that in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, Jesus woke up early to go spend time with his heavenly Father. How much more should we? First thing Jesus did in the morning, he spent time with his heavenly Father. And I promise you, the first thing we need to do is spend time with our heavenly Father. I'm not trying to be legalistic about that, but I'm telling you, starting your day off with the Lord sets the tone for the rest of your day. And if we're not prioritizing time with God, if we're not carving out time to spend with Him, then we're not going to hunger for more of Him. Anything we have put above God, anything that takes up all of our time, all of our energy, all of our effort, is an idol that we prioritize more than God. And we are saying to God, I am more satisfied with my sin or with this object than I am with you. Is that what your life's communicating today? What are you satisfied by? And if it's not the Lord, there's a problem. Because God calls us as his people to find our satisfaction in him and to hunger for more of him. And this mirror called the book of Jonah forces us to ask a very simple yet probing question. Am I satisfied with God? And if I'm not, why not? Let me put it to you a different way. What is the blood clot in your life keeping revival from coming to your heart? What is stopping revival from coming to your heart today? What is hindering you from desiring and hunger for more of God? The good news is, God is not forcing you out. He is drawing you in, saying, would you come and find your satisfaction in me would you come and hunger for more of me and if you're lost here today here's the good news god is not forcing you out either he is asking a similar question would you come and be saved today we as a people of god need to stop running to our sin to our idols or to whatever we think takes priority and trying to find satisfaction there because we will never find it Our satisfaction comes from the Lord and Him alone. So do you want more of God today? Are you satisfied with God? Because as a people changed by God, we should find our satisfaction only in Him. Would you bow with me this morning?